Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to our first lecture on Chapter 1. Uh, if you watched the welcome video, as you know, I'm John Lord. I'm your instructor for this class this uh, <clears throat> quarter. So I want to go ahead and uh, go through some of the slides that you've probably already seen for Chapter 1. And what I'm going to do uh, generally about the middle of the week is post a, a lecture talking about the slides and then go through some example practice midterm questions. So you get a feel as to how I'll be testing you on some of this material and see how what we're discussing in class will actually link up uh, to our um, discussions um, in class will link up to actual questions on our midterms. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, put my machine in slideshow mode, I think, so you can see the um, slides a little bit better. And let's go ahead and start with chapter one. And what we're going to do here it's just uh, really talk about definitions uh, to a large extent, then try to understand uh, almost what the uh, fraud triangle is about, uh, what really actually causes fraud, embezzlement, uh, larceny, some of the things that we're going to be defining in this class, kind okay, in, this, in, in this particular chapter. So let's go ahead and take a look. And when we talk about fraud, we are basically resolving uh, allegations and allegations. And we're going to look at a actual um, empirical data on how fraud is detected and often comes from tips, uh, complaints. There could be documents, accounting clues, maybe unusual transactions uh, that we identify. And then as we unpeel the onion, we find that there's actually, you know, willful intent to commit some sort of fraud or lar larceny. So you can look for documentary evidence, um, and that can lead to a predication of the fraud. You could interview uh, witnesses. Um, you will then be writing uh, investigative reports based on your work. You could be asked to testify in courts of law. Uh, of course, the uh, investigator is not the one that determines guilt. That, of course, is up to the courts. And then um, there are different uh, tools that can be used in detection uh, and prevention of fraud. And we'll talk about some of the controls that will prevent, but also uh, some tools that will allow you to detect if fraud has occurred. Um, when we talk about forensic accounting, okay, forensic accounting can get to the bottom of a, a variety of issues. For example, let's say somebody dies without a will. Well, what would be the appropriate distribution of the funds of the estate, that sort of thing. Well, that would fall under the idea of forensic accounting because we're going back after the fact and trying to establish, well, what should or could, uh, should have happened uh, based on this particular trend, uh, particular event. With fraud examination, there has been something called a predication. There's been a uh, accusation, if you will, through a tip line, um, through um, you know fraud hotline or something, that has uh, indicated there's potential for fraud, that could lead us to predication, and uh, then that will uh, lead us to an actual fraud examination where it's thinking there's actually some wrongdoing that has occurred. Now, <clears throat> uh, some of you may have studied uh, auditing already. Uh, some of you may be in my auditing class here uh, this quarter as well, but uh, just looking at this uh, differences in you know, comparison between auditing and fraud examination. An audit, as you probably know, is something that's recurring. Okay, it happens annually. Uh, public companies, in order to be listed on the stock exchange, have to have an audit every year. Fraud examination is non-recurring, as we've indicated. It comes out of some sort of accusation or indication of irregularities in the accounting records, um, those sort of things would lead to a fraud examination. Uh, the scope for an audit is um, more general. It's generally, like, for example, in the case of financial statement audit, looking to see if there are misstatements in those financial statements. Now, when we do an audit, we do consider the potential that the misstatement was by error, which is an accident, or by fraud, and fraud is defined by an error that fraud has intent. You meant to put the false statement in the financial statements, okay? So even though we look for misstatements, both caused by error or fraud in an audit, um, it is more general as to the overall financial statements. Whereas fraud examination, 
would be more specific. Uh, we believe that an employee has committed some sort of larceny, some sort of theft, um, they've misused their position, whatever it is, and then we go after to determine uh, if that has actually specific thing has occurred. The objective of financial statement audit is the opinion that you've probably seen on financial statements, whereas in a fraud examination, we're trying to fix blame. Who stole this property, uh, committed in, in, in some sort of um, larceny? Who's, larceny is a fancy word for stealing. Okay, Who made the inappropriate misstatement? We want to fix that blame. And so we are often in an adversarial mode, whereas in an audit, we not, may not be seen as adversarial. Um, sometimes people don't like auditors, but really the auditors are just trying to gain the evidence they need to support the opinion. And they may suggest friendly adjustments to the financial statements to correct, say, errors that had happened, whereas fraud, you know, were more adversarial because there could obviously be civil and criminal penalties associated with the identification of the fraud. Um, the methodology, there are specific audit techniques, and there are some overlap to those. But as we move through the course, we'll be talking about specific fraud examination techniques as we go through. Uh, presumption, professional skepticism. Okay, If I am told something in an audit and I'm in a position where I don't necessarily believe that that sounds or has a ring of truth to me to it, then I'm to look deeper to see if I can find some additional evidence that will help prove that the statement that was made to me was um, correct. Okay, maybe the person just made an error and they thought that they knew something that they didn't, but it doesn't quite ring true to me. So I dig a little further to get to the truth. With fraud examination, we are looking for proof that the fraud has occurred. Now, we don't end up determining the guilt of the individual, but we will then provide whatever our findings are, <clears throat> our evidence are to the courts. Courts, obviously, are the ones that eventually ultimately determine guilt. Predications, I've mentioned that word a couple of times again, and it's the totality of circumstances that would lead a reasonably trained professional to believe that fraud has occurred. Um, and it doesn't mean that we now are to a point where we're writing a report or not. It is asking us, should we go into the next steps of our fraud investigation? We'll talk about some of those. So predication is at a very high level. It could be a simple hotline call that we are going to investigate and see if there's any uh, merits behind whatever the fraud hotline call came in, whistleblower uh, accusations, whatever they are, okay? And so the fraud examination, as I stated, is going to be based on this predication. Now, once we uh, have determined there's a process that we go through, through, we will look at any available data. Data can come in both documentary, it can come from observations, it can come in the form of um, oral testimony, okay, as we start to interview people who may be, uh, have been witnesses to what has been going on. Based on that, we create a hypothesis, we test that hypothesis, and then we will refine and amend that hypothesis as we move along and get closer to the conclusions that will then be reported back through some sort of report or provided to courts, whatever it is that um, where we'll be providing our findings to. So when we look at the tools used, and I'm just going to go ahead and uh, I guess I'll show these as they come through, okay, uh, document analysis, okay, so we may have some sort of analysis that we're going to be looking at in trying to determine who uh, may have witnessed things, and then we're going to go ahead and, and we're going to start to talk to those neutral third parties. So we look at some document analysis, some evidence that something's going on, and then we try to corroborate that through witnesses. Okay, then we will go ahead and uh, talk to um, corroborative witnesses, those who are now telling us with the neutral third parties. Let me give a better example. Maybe somebody from outside the entity uh, says, hey, there was a problem. I think somebody is um, absconding with my money when I pay my account receivable, let's say. So we would start with that neutral third party, and then we would go and talk maybe internally to corroborate what that neutral third party said. 
Okay. And then if there are co-conspirators, there's something called collusion. And often what will happen in a, well, what happens in a collusion by definition is two people who have um, different authorization and maybe one has authorization and the other has the responsibility for record keeping, they work together to circumvent any controls. And so um, we would consider them to be co-conspirators and that eventually would lead us to whoever the target is, whoever the person was that came up with the entire scheme, whatever. And so we would work out from documentary evidence and in towards um, our eventual target. And of course, throughout this process, there would be observations that we would be making as we see uh, different indications that there may be some fraud. Okay, now um, we talk about occupational fraud and it's, it's about as simple as it sounds. Occupational fraud is fraud that's being committed by the employees of the entity. And it could be as high as owners, senior management, down to you know um, those that are maybe not uh, having as high of a position in the entity. Um, one thing that isn't so much talked about in occupational fraud here is the idea that customers can commit fraud, obviously, by stealing, or I guess we call that embezzlement, technically, um, when someone is stealing. So that can happen. Um, I was, you know, an auditor with the federal government for several years, an agency called the Government Accountability Office. And sometimes we would have those that are supposed to be beneficiaries of a program getting benefits inappropriately, and we would, you know, identify that. And that's also fraud, embezzlement, et cetera. Okay, so it doesn't have to be from inside the entity could come from outside, but we talk quite a bit about occupational fraud, fraud that is happening by the employees, owners and whatnot of the particular entity. So the elements of fraud, there needs to be a material misstatement. Um, in order for it to be fraud, there has to be intent. Okay, so the individual would have had to know that they were making this misstatement. Uh, the reliance of the victim, maybe the company or whoever's making the decision um, um, on that false statement, and then damages uh, resulting. These would be the elements of fraud because of reliance on the uh, false statement. And when we look at fraud versus larceny, okay, now it's, uh, when we talk about fraud, we talk about um, you know, inappropriate statement, misstatement in the financial statements, intentional misstatement would be considered fraud, right? But then there's stealing, and we use a fancy word for stealing, and we call that larceny, okay? And so just a technical definition, right? Taking somebody's property without the consent of the owner and with the intent to deprive, very legal, you know, very kind of terms here, it's stealing, and I think we all know what that is. Now, Embezzlement is a little bit different. It's the willfully taking or converting of, for one's own use another's money property for which the wrongdoer acquired possession lawfully. So now what? Now I'm an employee of the company. I have lawful access to the cash. I'm a cashier, but then what do I do? I embezzle it. I steal it. I use my position to then go ahead and steal that cash, whatever it is, okay? Conversion is a little bit different. It's an unauthorized assumption and exercise of the right of ownership over goods. So I allow you to use my software license, even though I was only supposed to install on my computer, I figure out a way of allowing you to also download and have the use of my software via the cloud, whatever it is. And, um, you know, I have now converted that right that I had to allow you to do that. That would be considered conversion. Uh, another example of embezzlement, um, going back a little bit here. Uh, let's say I need some help maintaining my records. Let's say I'm getting a little older and I'm not as good with, you know, handling my banking records and stuff. So I give you access to my bank account. And then you go in and instead of helping me to pay my bills, you cut yourself a check for you know $10,000 or something. That also would be embezzlement. You had acquired possession lawfully because I gave you access, but you did not use it appropriately. You willfully converted it to your own use. 
Okay, so just some terms there, fraud, you're talking about it more in terms of misstatements, whereas larceny, is stealing, embezzlement is, hey, I gave you access to property and then you stole it. Conversion is letting somebody use the right that you have. And the best example there is, a, you know, a license to use something and then I go ahead and I give it to you, even though I was supposed to be the one that was supposed to have the right to use that. Fraud triangle. Um, and so when fraud occurs, okay, what we typically see are these three particular things, which is incentive and pressure. And we're going to use another term for incentive and pressure. Incentive pressure is the reason to commit the fraud. Wow. If I don't um, show a good third quarter revenue, I'm going to get fired. That's pressure incentive. If I show nice revenue, I'm going to get a bigger bonus, right? Uh, but you could also call this um, an unshareable financial risk in that I have to, you know, compete um, embezzlement and steal money because if I don't, I'm not going to be able to pay my rent, okay? So um, that would be equivalent. Sometimes we'll call it an, a non-shareable financial risk. It's the reason, okay, to go ahead and commit the fraud, okay? Now, uh, rationalization is saying, hey, I deserve this thing that I'm stealing. You know, so-and-so got a big bonus. I got left out of the bonus, so I'm gonna steal $10,000 to make up for that. That's rationalization. Opportunity is really poor internal control. So what happens? Even in an audit, we are required to look at certain risks that affect our audit risk and assess those risks and see if they are uh, leading to some sort of potential for fraud. And so that risk opportunity really is looking at internal controls and seeing if there's a problem with those internal controls that could lead to some sort of embezzlement, fraud, et cetera. Um, I was on an assignment when I was looking at the Department of Veteran Affairs some years back in which the uh, Veteran Affairs Department would look to see how much money pension, uh, how, many pension how much in pension benefits uh, veterans were getting because um, if they also received Social Security, their Social Security would be reduced by any pension benefits. They, what uh, the veteran Department of Veteran Affairs would do is they would look to see, uh, the, so they would bounce the pension records, payment records against the Social Security payment records. And if they got a match, they would pull back the benefits accordingly. They didn't do the same thing with their compensation benefits. Compensation benefits are um, if an individual loses a limb or something in the war, the government will pay them so much per year for the rest of their life, um, regardless of how much money they make, because that's compensating them for the irreplaceable you know, situation, the loss of a leg. Uh, well, the benefits do not continue after someone dies. It turns out that um, the federal government gets all death information from counties, and it gets that information through Social Security. Well, by not bouncing those compensation records against the Social Security and the VA's rationale was not this rationalization, but their you know, theory was that we don't have to do that because it doesn't matter how much money the person made. But my question was, well, what if the person dies? The benefit should stop. So shouldn't you also bounce those um, compensation records against the social security records as well. So I asked and went and asked, seeing that opportunity was there, I went and asked and I said, hey, can I please have the records of individuals that were uh, receiving benefits after they died? Their family was receiving the benefits after they died. And the VA just handed those to me because it sounded as I did the interviewing technique that I knew that the records already existed. The reason I was able to take that approach is opportunity was there. In my opinion, opportunity is the biggest reason that you will see some sort of fraud. And that if you leave the door open, it's only human nature that eventually someone's going to you know, walk through that door and you're going to have fraud um, or uh, 
you know, theft, whatever it is that we're um, talking about here is the different things, embezzlement and so on. Okay, okay, so you typically see those and um, we have uh, some of the broad triangle discussion that you saw there, but there's uh, similar studies that are done. This particular one that you can see in the textbook, this Donald R. Cressy uh, studied embezzlers. These are trust violators and uh, develop a high thought by the hypothesis known as the fraud triangle, which is a little bit different, but very similar to what we saw in the previous slide. Uh, perceived non-shareable financial need, that's what pressure uh, or incentive to commit the fraud, okay? And so you have what? Um, violation of ascribed obligations. I'm not going to be able to pay my rent. Okay, problems resulting from personal failure. And I'm not doing so well in my career, but I certainly feel a lot better if I were able to figure out how to get a new car or something. Right? Uh, business reversals. Um, there have been, you know, changes in the um, uh, the business uh, ability to generate income and whatnot. Maybe my significant other has a business that isn't doing too well now, and so I'm going to try to commit some sort of fraud or embezzlement um, in order to cover that, okay? Uh, gaining status. Gee, it sure would be nice if I had a nice car like my neighbor, a nicer house than my neighbor, a better you know, backyard or whatever it is. You know, those sort of things. Uh, employer, employee relations, obviously, you know, not, not going very well in that pursuit. Um, situation. Uh, perceived opportunity. Perceived opportunity to me is a kind way of saying poor internal controls. Okay, A perceived opportunity almost questions, well, is the opportunity there? Well, if the opportunity isn't there, how are they going to commit the fraud if we are the embezzlement or whatever it is, the theft, uh, the larceny? If we're sitting there and we have the controls, then how can it happen? So perceived opportunity and what? actual opportunity um, would lead to this. And then rationalization, okay? Hey, uh, you know, it's not that bad. The company has a lot of money. I've worked here a long time, et cetera, okay? And that person will rationalize committing the fraud, okay? Now, just some things, and we're gonna go through now that we have some of these definitions and uh, look at some uh, practice midterm questions pretty quickly here, but just some interesting things as to uh, how occupational fraud occurs. Generally, it is the employees, but you can see, um, you know, 41.6% of the time it's the employees, but you can see that what often it goes as high as managers and even executives of the company. Um, if you look at the loss, the executives, owners of the company uh, seem to be able to figure out, even though they're not as frequent, they must have larger dollar amounts associated with those, but you can see um, the median loss depending on who committed the fraud. As a CPA, I'm sad to say accounting tops the list, and I think it's because of the notion that to identify fraud, there has to be some sort of documentation, and when uh, we talked about that, there doesn't have to be, but usually that's kind of an early step, and so the accounting folks maybe think that they can get past that, but you can see it goes through all different um, parts of the company. Okay, and um, the accountants are at the top of the list for committing a little lower down the list in terms of the dollar amount. Again, uh, executive management uh, being a little higher, probably because they have higher levels of authorization in the company, which allows them to maybe get away with uh, a little more. Okay, uh, criminal history. Um, you know, often it's in individuals, most of the time, they never did anything before, and maybe that door got cracked open. Again, I'm a big believer in that opportunity is a big cause, and they decided to walk through. Okay, and then you can see the um, size of the company. And interestingly, um, you know, smaller companies seem to be pretty high here on the list in terms of, uh, you know, the loss per number of employees. Tips, as I mentioned, that's the biggest way that these things are found. Um, audits, okay, both external and internal. They don't mention external. Oh, they do. Um, you can see that external is down there as well. Um, notified by police. Uh, sometimes um, there will be a situation, I've heard of stories where uh, there have been overseas wires that have been being 
uh, were being issued and the company thought that it was actually a legitimate transaction, but it was one of these, you know, dear so-and-so I'm out of the country. And so wire me, you know, $500,000. And what happens is if they get away with it the first time, they do it again. And so the FBI came into the company and said, why are you sending all this money overseas? And they said, we're not. And they said, yes, you are. And that's how it was found uh, by, you know, maybe monitoring from the police, et cetera. OK, so you can see these uh, different ways that uh, fraud is often detected, but tips, hotlines being an important. OK, now, when we look at um, different types of fraud, asset misappropriation, such as cash, inventory. Uh, obviously, if we're stealing cash and whatnot, that's, you know, um, that's what we call it larceny, theft, fraud. Um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be stealing. It could be abuse. So what happens? Um, I have access to the company's fleet of cars uh, and in the weekends, I, you know, drive one of the cars off the lot and, you know, drive around and go all kinds of different places and, you know, abuse. That's abuse. I abuse the asset. OK. And, and that happens quite a bit. Um, and then we could be, you know, stealing inventory, et cetera. You could see uh, fraudulent financial statements. Um, obviously, there can be fraudulent numbers in the financial statements. But then there could be fraudulent non-financial. In other words, we make statements in our footnotes, in our management discussion analysis that are fraudulent, misleading. Okay, uh, Corruption, conflicts of interest. Uh, if I am aware, I have insider information. I'm not supposed to trade on that. Bribery, uh, illegal gratuities, um, economic extortion, all of these things um, would be considered corruption. Okay, and then uh, fraud and abuse, um, asset misappropriation. Okay, we mentioned corruption and fraudulent financial statements. Uh, and again, occupational fraud, that's fraud that's being committed inside. It could also be those outside committing the fraud, as we mentioned. Okay, so that gives us a nice set of definitions. So what I want to do now is go over the practice midterm with you so you can see how we're going to be testing on this kind of material when, once we get to our midterms and stuff, okay? So you can see this first question, once sufficient predication has been established, once we determine, hey, there is reasonable cause to believe that there's fraud here, we call that predication, what is the first step a fraud examiner follows um, following the fraud theory approach, what are the uh, first step we should take? And what we saw on that chart, as you can see here is the correct answer, we will do what? We will analyze data. We will go ahead and what? Interview the witnesses. And then we will uh, eventually get to the target, whoever the suspect is. And creating a hypothesis is basically something that is done in the stage of the predication, not after the predication. Okay, number two, in order to prove that fraud occurred, four elements must be present. Which of the following is not one of those um, uh, elements and intent to cause uh, the victim damages? So if somebody's putting something fraudulently in the financial statements, they may be just hoping, okay, well, this will make us look good and will attract additional capital and then the company will grow and everything will be fine. We just need to get the capital in there and then it doesn't work out and people suffer losses. Well, that may not have been the intent, but material false statement, knowledge that the fake statement was false. Yeah, it's intent. We meant to do it, right? And then reliance on the uh, false statement by the victim. Yeah, um, we don't necessarily have to want to cause harm, but often what happens when this stuff happens, when there's fraud, people are harmed. And that's when, you know, we start to have to go through courts and that sort of thing. Uh, which of the following is not one of the legs of the five, uh, fraud triangle? Perceived non-shareable uh, financial need, Again, um, that could also be called pressure, right? Um, perceived opportunity, rationalization, uh, situational environment, you know, it's a sort of something 
that we are making up here because uh, they have to have a multiple choice question. The other three, the takeaway from this question, the other three are clearly part of the fraud triangle. Okay, let's look at a um, couple of, you know, sort of, uh, you know, fictitious names and stuff here. And it says when Jill Michaels, an assistant to the director of procurement, moved into her new home, uh, she used the company's flatbed truck to move her furnishings on an afternoon when her boss was out of town. What is this? Well, this is abuse. It wasn't larceny. They didn't steal it. It wasn't embezzlement because, again, it didn't involve her actually taking something and depriving the owner of the use of that, right? Uh, it was simply borrowing it, but inappropriately borrowing it. So that's an abuse. And fraud, you know, fraud and larceny, you know, one is what? One is lying, fraud, the other larceny is stealing. Okay. And so um, they wouldn't really fit so much with that uh, as fraud as it is as abuse. Okay. Number five, Alice Durant works in the accounts payable department for BC Group. She recently found out that the Della Grander, that Della Grander, I guess another person, um, another AP clerk, in fact, received a bigger raise than she did, even though Durant had been with the company longer and frequently had us to correct Granger's errors. Which leg of the fraud triangle best applies? This is rationalization, right? Um, rationalization says, hey, I've committed, I'm going to commit this um, this crime because, and, and I should be, you know, this fraud and I should be able to this embezzlement, whatever. And I should be able to do this because they all me, right? Okay, number six, Samantha Lewis, CFE, um, which is a certified fraud examiner. Uh, when we get into uh, some of the um, discussion of standards here coming up pretty quickly, we'll talk about the, uh, the Institute of Fraud Examiners that have certain standards and whatnot. They give you an exam, and if you want to, you could become a certified fraud examiner. Uh, some folks go in the direction of CPA. Some folks specialize in fraud, so they could get a CFE. Often CPAs will uh, also be CFEs because they want to specialize in a particular area. Uh, but anyway, Samantha Lewis CFE is conducting an investigation of possible skimming of the accounts receivable by Southwest Paint and Supply Company. If Lewis plans to interview all the following parties, whom would they interview first? And remember, we said what we had that part where it's sort of, um, you know, third party observers, right? And so Sean Miles, a regular customer of the company, whose complaint about his account balance problem uh, promoted uh, prompted the investigation. That's those third party individuals. And then we would work in from there until we finally get to whoever the target is. Number seven, Richard Moore is the controller of Ajax company. Recently, he suffered several large losses at the racetrack, causing to uh, incur enormous personal debts. Which type of non-shareable financial problem best describes Richard's situation? And this is what? Violation of ascribed obligations. He's not going to be able to pay his bills, okay, essentially is what's going on here. And so, um, you know, because he had these losses, he has financial problems now, so he can't, um, you know, he can't pay his bills. And so that's an ascribed obligation. And so uh, he's going to violate those if he doesn't steal his money because of his doings at the racetrack. Number eight, Eddie Dolan is the manager of the shipping receiving and has been working at the UFA company for 20 years. He rarely calls in sick and gets good performance review every year. For the past year, his wife's company, ABC company, has been in serious financial trouble. Let me back up a little bit. So you're like, what does his vacation record have to do with it? Often what happens is fraud is discovered while somebody's on vacation. And the reason the person doesn't take the vacation is because they're trying to cover their tracks all the time. So they're kind of throwing that in as, hey, you had this observation, this indication that maybe this person hasn't taken a vacation that much or at all. What's going on? Okay, and so uh, that might lead you to look a little closer to see what might be going on with them. Okay, they, we didn't mention that during the lecture, 
uh, but there's a reason they're mentioning their vacation record. Okay. So for the past year, his wife's company has been in serious financial trouble and um, they're likely not to be able to make the payroll ooh, for the next month and may have to close down, which leg, this is again, non-shareable financial need, right? They got to pay this bill and whatnot. And uh, so they're probably, you know, going to have to do something. And unfortunately, they start embezzling. Um, Joel Baker, a customer of ABC uh, Electronics, stole a bot containing computer games while the sales associate uh, waited on another customer. So he's a customer. The sales associate goes over here and he steals a box. That is what that is considered larceny. If they were in position of what of some sort of trust or something, and then they uh, stole it, that would be embezzlement fraud. We're typically uh, considering that to be statements, right? Number ten, uh, author Baxter, a manager in records retention for SWC company, has ordered seven laptop computers for his department, even though he only has five employees, okay? In addition to each laptop, he ordered extra copies of several software programs. When the equipment arrives, Baxter sends one of the extra laptops to his son, who is freshman at uh, Eastern University and sells three of the original software packages to friends. Which of the following offenses would this be? Well, is it larceny? Yeah, because he stole. Is it embezzlement? Yeah, it's embezzlement because um, he uh, used his position of trust in the company to take possession of these laptops. It's conversion because of the licenses. So it's all of the above. Okay, so uh, you can see how we are using these definitions here. Um, you know, one thing as I read through these scenario, particularly this last one, you know, um, there are ways to have prevented this. For example, if he can order the laptops, he shouldn't be allowed to receive them. So that in the internal controls, we would separate what? We would separate the custody from the authorization. And by doing that, you would prevent this um, particular kind of fraud uh, from happening. So again, there was opportunity that allowed, and this is larceny, embezzlement, and uh, conversion as well. Okay. Okay, guys, hopefully that is helpful for you. That's the way we're going to be testing this stuff. So um, stay tuned for chapter two. And this is how we're going to do the class lecture for the chapter with the slides, practice midterm for the lecture, okay? Okay, guys, um, we will talk to you soon.